We're on alert tonight for a mystery virus exploding in China. It's similar to the flu, but doctors aren't sure where it comes from or how it spreads. So starting today, the CDC is deploying 100 staffers to screen people who arrive at three U.S. airports where flights come in from one specific Chinese city. CDC staff are looking for signs of a new disease, which is a variation of the coronavirus that includes the common cold and SARS virus, which spread worldwide back in 2003, killing almost 800 people. This is a virus that affects the lungs, so it sounds a little bit like influenza. Fever, chills, aches, difficulty breathing, <coughs> and a cough. 45 cases have been reported in China, including two deaths. There are three direct flights that come from Wuhan to JFK every week. Now, as far as China, there are millions of people preparing to travel because of the new lunar year. A grave concern. Those words from the World Health Organization as the coronavirus tops more than 6,000 cases in China. And here in the States, the CDC is closely monitoring 165 patients in 36 states for the flu-like virus. Earlier today, a plane carrying American evacuees from Wuhan landed in Southern California. One of those passengers is a Stony Brook professor who was visiting family members near the outbreak area. CDC workers screened the group for coronavirus in Alaska during a refueling stop. But so far, not a single case, not one, has been confirmed in the tri-state area. We're going to begin with concerns about coronavirus. It has been driving down the markets all week, even though it's not reached the level of a pandemic. But the World Health Organization warns that it could. The organization says the global risk is very high and the virus could soon reach every country. Live from News 4 New York, this is a special report. Good morning, I'm Darlene Rodriguez. We do have a special report regarding the coronavirus outbreak. New York Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio about Dr. to give an update on the city's first confirmed case. Let's listen in. It wasn't a question of if, but when. This is New York. We're a gateway to the world. You see all these cases around the world, around the country. Of course, we're going to have it here. That man in his 30s is from Fort Lee, New Jersey, and he is believed to be receiving treatment here at Hackensack Meridian Medical Center since yesterday. Now, his case is being called presumptive because the New Jersey Department of Health Laboratories is the one that conducted the testing, but it still has to be definitively confirmed by the CDC. Still, the governor making it clear that they believe the first case of novel coronavirus has arrived in New Jersey. Sources with knowledge of the patient say the man in his 30s had contact with one of the 11 people infected in New York, though at this point it is unclear which one. In New York, eight hospital workers in Bronxville awaiting their results after coming into contact with the lawyer from New Rochelle who is hospitalized with the virus. I'm scared because I have my kids too. Sergio Caroy pumps gas right across the street from Lawrence Hospital, handling money and credit cards all day. Now I got to clean everything when I'm going to start working with bleach. Governor Cuomo announced Wednesday the Westchester County lawyer's wife, daughter and son tested positive. A family friend who he spent time with is also positive, as are his wife and three children. Officials also announcing the neighbor who drove the lawyer to the hospital has the virus. Steering clear of coronavirus on mass transit means a level of cleanliness even MTA bosses admit they've never tried before. This is an unprecedented level. And again, we're not cleaning, we're disinfecting. Using a disinfectant called lemon quat, transit workers are wiping down poles and seats and every other surface on nearly 6,000 buses. The number of cases surged again today, and many of those Westchester County patients are believed to be linked to that new Rochelle man who works as a lawyer in Manhattan. He is still in serious condition here at Columbia Presbyterian, and now several others are hospitalized as well. On Saturday, 11 new cases confirmed in New York City, one of the patients now hospitalized in Queens. And the state of Connecticut announced another connection to a confirmed case of COVID-19. Governor Cuomo also announcing plans to protect those most vulnerable, like senior citizens and the immune compromised. Nursing home, senior living uh, situations in that immediate area of New Rochelle, will suspend outside visitors. Again, the nursing homes are the most problematic setting for us with this disease. 
So we are hyper cautious. Meanwhile, state officials are still insisting the public health risk is low. They believe 80% of people who become infected will get better. And for now, the only thing worse than the virus is the fear and anxiety. The coronavirus outbreak is disrupting more schools, businesses, even how public transportation operates. And there are more than 100 cases in New York State alone. And as people return to work, the governor and the mayor are urging companies to let people work from home or stagger their schedules whenever possible. Both are also urging those who are sick to stay off subways and buses. New York has the most cases in the tri-state, but New Jersey and Connecticut reported more cases today. And the virus is forcing more than a dozen schools to close. We have a is scrolling at the bottom of your screen. Today, Governor Cuomo toured a new testing facility just approved for coronavirus in New Hyde Park as he urged the federal government to facilitate more COVID-19 tests to help disease detectives do their job. What happens if you don't contain the spread? Two things happen. Uh, first, you would have to take uh, more drastic measures. Uh, what you what we have seen in China, what we're seeing in Italy, you'd have to do massive quarantine, which would be very disruptive to society and the economy. We could well be at 100 cases or hundreds of cases over the next two or three weeks. We have to be prepared for that reality. And those with high risk factors need to be especially prepared, including anyone over the age of 50, anyone with heart disease, lung disease, cancer, a compromised immune system, or diabetes. At this point, all New York City public schools are open. However, international travel has been canceled, and the city has hired 85 additional school nurses to make sure every school building is adequately staffed. You can go home, do it by distance, go wherever you want to go. The governor's decision to try and slow the pandemic spread by reducing close contact, effectively closing some 80 campuses and impacting nearly a million students. Chopper 4 flew over SUNY Purchase in Westchester, about 14 miles from the coronavirus epicenter of New Rochelle. While at Manhattan Community College, one professor wonders why the CUNY and SUNY transition doesn't happen till March 19th. Takes you a week to understand how bad it is? Is that really the, is that really the excuses? For students, we found a mixed reaction from understanding. I mean, I agree, I think, until we find a better solution. To anxiety. It's more complicated because it's like, what about my education too? You're worried about it. Yeah, I'm worried about it. To grudging acceptance. If we want to be positive, we can be positive about it. We can learn online if we have to, which we apparently have to. I'm just learning now. Meanwhile, at the New York City offices of 311. Hey, thank you for calling 311. My name is Bill. How may I help you? Mayor Bill de Blasio answering questions with some 2,000 calls per day about coronavirus. You experience any symptoms at any moment. Reminding New Yorkers who feel sick to stay home. The mayor telling us his health experts say there's no evidence you can get coronavirus from someone who feels healthy. So when it comes to the coronavirus, one of the biggest points of confusion continues to be how it spread and how long it survives on surfaces and in the air. The authors of this federally funded study asked the simple question, how long can the virus survive in five different environments? Now, in this study, the virus died on copper in just four hours, but it lasted the longest on steel and plastic, up to two to three days. Aggressive measure in Westchester County, where Governor Cuomo's containment zone is now in effect. Healthy people can still move in and out of the area. The National Guard is there, though, not enforcing checkpoints. They're helping to hand out food and supplies. Starting tomorrow, all public schools in New Rochelle will be closed through March 25th. News Force's Mark Santia is there. Mark, give us a sense of how people are dealing with this containment zone. Yeah, David, people are remaining positive. I'm going to step out and give you a live look at a new development here. Multiple government sources confirmed to myself and my colleague, Andrew Siff, that starting tomorrow, Glen Island Park here in New Rochelle will become the first public drive through coronavirus testing facility on the East Coast. All right, we want to get right to Dr. Jennifer Haith. She is a critical care cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at Columbia University. Thank you for joining us. Doctor, we've heard our elected officials try to tell us we're starting to ramp up, but you're in it. I want to know from you and your colleagues, the water cooler talk about how prepared our healthcare system mm -hmm. is right now for what could be coming. 
So I think the real concern here is that our healthcare system is not prepared for a huge surge in patients, particularly if a lot of those patients need critical care or intensive care. So, for instance, we only have, you know, around 62, 65,000 ventilators in this country. So if you think about that in terms of, you know, spread out over the whole country, multiple cities, and then a large number of people getting sick, even if a small percentage of those people need critical care care, that's going to be a problem for our hospital systems because we can't manage all those patients. You know, our ICUs are already very full as it is. As of tomorrow, our public schools will be closed. In other words, to all parents who are hearing this now, there is no school tomorrow, and we will be suspending our public schools until after the spring vacation. With a tentative return date of April 20th, that means a million public school students will not set foot in their school buildings for more than a month. As hospitals prepare for a surge of coronavirus patients, Governor Cuomo addressing what he calls a desperate shortage of hospital beds in New York. I don't think of a curve. I think of a wave. And the wave is going to break and the wave is going to break on the hospital system. The governor issuing an executive order today, allowing the National Guard and private developers to convert existing buildings like dorms and former nursing homes into makeshift hospitals with 9,000 more beds, including 5,000 in the city, 2,000 on Long Island, and 2,000 in Westchester. There are only 45,000 ICU beds in America and about 160,000 ventilators. And the next thing that's going to happen is the economic hit. We're now in the final hours, as you indicated, for thousands and thousands of businesses, big and small, with the exception of takeout and delivery, restaurants and bars tonight at 8 p.m. are about to close. As you can see, I have no customers on a Monday. Bartender Cheryl Mosley won't have customers on a Tuesday either. New restrictions are set to begin in New Jersey. At 8, casinos, gyms, and non-essential businesses will close. Restaurants and bars will stop serving in-house, but will offer delivery and takeout. All schools and universities have been ordered to close on Wednesday. We have an I-Team exclusive tonight. Emergency medical technicians, they are on the front lines of this coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> Carol DeMont is front and center of a team of volunteer EMTs at the Ramapo Valley Ambulance Corps. Responding to potential coronavirus calls amid other emergencies. They're now getting upward of a dozen calls a day and running dangerously low on protective equipment. We don't have enough masks. Um, each call is one mask. So we have an order of 250 masks that are supposed to be here. They're not here yet. Most agree extreme social distancing measures are intended to prevent or at least delay the crush of severe cases in the nation's hospital. News source Chris Corioso explains how one person's decision to self-isolate now could keep dozens of people alive by the end of May. Let's assume there are 5,000 COVID-19 cases in the United States right now. It's March 17th. If you assume one infected person infects two more and a doubling of cases every six days, next week you'll have 10,000 cases. And assuming exponential growth by the end of May, you'd be talking about 20 and a half million cases. If you assume the fatality rate reported by China, 2.3%, that would mean more than 470,000 deaths. That is sobering. But what if we could go back in time to March 17th, erase that 5,000 number and replace it with 4,999? We've now just isolated that one infected person. The theoretical result of removing just that one infected person would mean by the end of April, you would prevent or delay three deaths. And by the end of May, removing that one person from the equation would prevent or delay 95 deaths. Hundreds lined up at New Jersey's first drive through state testing clinic. This is in partnership with FEMA. The testing site here behind me opened up at 8 o'clock this morning, but by noon it was all over. They just couldn't process all of the people. We're learning about a heartbreaking situation in tonight's I-Team exclusive. Group homes for the developmentally disabled throughout the city say they're overwhelmed with COVID-19 cases. Disabled patients who don't understand what's happening and won't wear masks. This video shows happier days at a program for almost 200 autistic and developmentally delayed New Yorkers before the coronavirus started spreading like wildfire through their group homes. 
It's been rapid fire. Libby Trainer runs the program AABR, which has a contract with New York State to run 22 group homes for the disabled throughout the five boroughs. The staff at AABR say they don't have enough masks and gowns to bring their people home and keep them safe in isolation. The program pleaded with the City Office of Emergency Management for one week's worth of personal protective equipment. But OEM sent an email obtained by News 4, saying the program for the disabled falls below the priority level for personal protective equipment, adding that the program should seek the equipment through normal sourcing processes. Without help from the city or the state, the program is now asking anyone else who might be able to help to go to their website. Governor Cuomo's office taking action after a News 4 report showed a desperate need for protective equipment at city group homes that care for the developmentally disabled. Governor Cuomo's secretary tweeting response saying, we have connected with this facility and protective equipment is on the way. Today's the first day that New York is on pause to slow the spread of coronavirus across the state and streets, well, they are mostly empty. Empty is non-essential workers stay home. Take a look at this. There's going to be four emergency hospitals inside of the Javits Center here. Each of those hospitals equipped with 250 beds for a total of 1,000 extra hospital beds. <laughs> Employees are working feverishly at this massive warehouse in an industrial section of Orangeburg, Rockland County. I mean, the calls literally are nonstop. Dynarex is one of the biggest suppliers of medical disposable products in the Northeast. Masks, gowns, gloves. Could you ever have predicted that this kind of thing would have happened? You know, I've been in the business over 35 years, and we've seen a lot of other outbreaks, uh, bird flu, Ebola, and so on, but it never hit us to this extent. There's already been one death at St. Joe's behind me last week. Most of the staff sick with coronavirus, some two dozen patients sick with coronavirus. They assume everybody has it now. First responders in head to toe hazmat suit orchestrating a delicate life saving operation. Nearly 100 residents with masks on in wheelchairs or walking on their own, carefully being taken out of St. Joe's senior nursing home one by one transferred into mobile ambulance buses. Personal protective equipment is in desperate demand. Healthcare workers need masks. New Jersey doctor Alexander Salerno speaks to us remotely. He says a lack of PPE supplies drove him to the black market where he discovered a warehouse full of medical equipment for an astronomical price. We had to go literally to these black market brokers or black you know, market pirates and we are paying like 400 to 800 percent markups. He says the need to protect his staff led him to pay over $17,000 for gear that would have normally cost him 2000 The seller would wouldn't give his name and sent him to an unmarked warehouse. And an update now on a story we first brought you at five yesterday. We're talking about the doctors who are so desperate for supplies, they've been turning to the black market. But after our story yesterday, the FBI is stepping in. It's a top priority for Department of Justice and the FBI working to uh, working to stop these scams. Right here behind me on 30th Street near the FDR, a mobile makeshift morgue. It's part of the city's plan for a pandemic, ready if needed, with New York the epicenter of the coronavirus crisis. It's been scary. On Sunday, COVID-19 hospitalizations in New York were doubling every two days. Monday, the rate slowed to 3.4, and yesterday, 4.7. Where I'm standing, just the latest in what seems like an infinite series of examples of surreal visuals during this pandemic. I'm on Park Avenue. Between here on 34th Street and 28th Street, there are no cars. The whole purpose on nice days like this, so people can get out of their apartments briefly and walk around without getting in each other's way to observe social distancing. And today marked more new measures. Construction sites on notice. They need to shut down to preserve social distancing unless the work is essential. And at Elmhurst Hospital, so far the city's epicenter after enduring one day with 13 deaths, the mayor said critical gear has been stocked up. And I can tell you right now we have enough supplies to get through this week and next week in our hospitals. But doctors and nurses on the front lines say the daily toll has worn them down. Every time I leave from the shift, I cry. I know that from the beginning of this crisis, all of you watching at home and all of us certainly in News 4 have marveled at the courage and the dedication of our health care providers. But what's it like? What's it really like to spend all night on a COVID ward treating patients? 
This nurse works with patients who have the worst prognoses. These are people on ventilators who are completely dependent on hospital critical care. We asked her to make a video diary. This is too much. I don't know how much longer I can do this. Sheena Tannis is a Brooklyn critical care nurse who agreed to show us what an overnight shift is like treating only the worst COVID-19 patients. It's 10 p.m. I'm heading in to give medications to my COVID patients. EMTs now must make life or death calls. New policy instructing not to deliver patients in cardiac arrest to emergency rooms. At the 2 million square foot Javits Center, a major donation today. Hundreds of thousands of protective masks sent by the New England Patriots to help address the shortage of critical gear. More urgent now that Javits is a field hospital for COVID patients. This is definitely the biggest thing I've experienced. I've been through 9-11. Dr. Ernest Patty says his emergency room at St. Barnabas in the Bronx is overwhelmed. We have 17 patients on respirators right now in the emergency department. More ventilators are needed, nearly 3,000 more just to make it through next week. And Mayor de Blasio says his city must have 15,000 more for April and May. The city's sending out that alert at 515 today through your phones. If you know of anyone who could volunteer, you're asked to go to nyc.gov slash help now, a licensed health care worker. That is the requirement. Minutes before 7 o'clock Friday night, they assemble. New York's bravest lined up, engine after engine, firefighters got out of their truck. And as the clock struck 7, traffic stood still. The cheering, the clapping began. The sirens, the applause, the gratitude for the heroism unfolding inside emergency rooms and hospitals across New York City. A way to say thank you to those nurses and doctors, EMTs, who are trying to save lives. We're so grateful for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank supporting you so much. us. There is growing evidence that the coronavirus is having a much bigger impact on communities of color, especially African-American and Latino communities. The city's most recent numbers show high rates of coronavirus infection in Queens and Brooklyn, sections like Elmhurst and East New York. Public advocate Jamani Williams is calling for the city to show the data it has. And so the trend in New York City and New York State, which is supposed to be a progressive beacon, should have not been that these communities uh, get hit harder than others. It's racial disparity of coronavirus cases. You heard about it in the city. There's also a concern about this, how this is impacting different communities on Long Island. In English and Spanish, a COVID alert echoed from a Suffolk police truck in Huntington Station. The messaging is part of a stepped up county effort to reach immigrants in this coronavirus hotspot. I'm scared, you know, because I have my baby at home. Alan Cuvas is a laid off restaurant worker worried about feeding his family. And that concern forces him to put himself at risk and go out every day looking for a way to make money. I had to do something. No fevers, that's what we like. Steve Colosi, a former Army medic, packed up his trailer in Virginia nearly two weeks ago and left his wife behind to come and take care of her elderly parents, Dick and Joan Hebert. Both were then seriously ill with coronavirus. Colosi is modest about the role he's taken on. It's not about me, you know, it's, it's about taking care of people. The tragic melody a young man salute to veterans at New Jersey Veterans Home. So many of their service members lost to COVID-19. 37 veterans at the Paramus facility died in recent weeks. Dozens more residents are sick, along with staff who have also tested positive. National Guard medics en route to help with the outbreak. New research tonight that suggests the first coronavirus cases here in New York City didn't come from China, they came from Europe. And it could have been happening in early February, a month before the president blocked travelers from Europe. It was important to note that um, the data suggests that the virus um, circulated undetected for a couple of weeks in our metropolitan area. I'm, very good. I'm good. The legendary St. John's University basketball coach was born in 1925. Our relationship goes back to the early 1980s when I hosted his coach's show on MSG Network. So I decided to take Louie on a happier journey down memory lane. I brought you some pictures to share, right? This is unbelievable. 
This was that show we did in Manhattan. Yes, the middle one, yeah. A young Beck and a young Mullen. Beautiful one, I like that one, I got it. You remember this big fella named Willis Reed? Great pictures. This one you autographed to Bruce. If only you could talk. <laughs> Do I look the same? You better look him out. <laughs> Island Harvest brought 17,000 pounds of groceries to give out today. And judging by the line of cars and people, it was needed as a steady stream of cars and pedestrians came to seek food. Only my dad's working right now and my mom has to stay at home. He drove down from upstate New York to take his brother out of the facility that's been ravaged by coronavirus deaths. 18 bodies were found in a makeshift morgue last week. I have a plan that's to pick my brother up and, and run. Traditionally, contact tracing looks like this. An infected person is identified, investigators notify and test his or her family, co-workers, and anyone with whom he or she has socialized. But what about strangers on a train or in an elevator? That is the unique challenge in America's most densely populated region. It is a problem in a densely populated area. Dr. Bruce Farber is the Northwell Health Chief of Infectious Disease. He told us contact tracing in the tri-state will require lots of money and lots of innovation. One of those innovations may be movement tracking technology. MIT has developed an app that allows mobile phones to anonymously talk with each other. And if yours has come near an infected person, you'll get an alert. Even as many of the tests boast about accuracy, the World Health Organization says there's no proof that antibodies give you immunity. I decided to take an antibody test myself. Four days later, I got my results. It says non-reactive, which means I likely have not been infected in the past, but the report clearly also shows negative results do not rule out infection. And it says this test is not FDA approved. Two days ago, British pediatricians warned of a small but troubling rise in children sick with a serious inflammatory condition that they suspect is linked to COVID-19. Well, now the I-team's Melissa Russo has learned that some local doctors have their eye on some children hospitalized here with some similar symptoms. Inside Mount Sinai's pediatric ICU this week, at least two children in shock with serious inflammatory disease, according to a hospital source who says at least one of those children tested positive for COVID-19. Raising the question, is New York now seeing what British health officials were worried about when they issued an alert over the weekend? British health officials suspect in at least a dozen children there, COVID-19 may have caused an inflammatory response known as Kawasaki disease. Symptoms can include fever for five days, red eyes, gastrointestinal distress, and if untreated, it can cause heart damage and even death. 15 children have been hospitalized in the city, and of those, four have tested positive for COVID. Six others had antibodies. Mayor de Blasio admitting today that they were a little slow to realize this new wave. Now they're trying to catch up so they can track the scope. I heard him call for mommy. He looked over at his face, and I saw his his lips are all blue at that point. The new warning from City Hall comes a week after the I-team told the mayor and health commissioner that this was happening to multiple children in our area. They were unaware. We have not seen this to date. So I want to thank Melissa Russo, who raised an important issue about uh, a problem we're starting to see and we take it very seriously. We've got to get to breaking news in the Flatlands section of Brooklyn Live Pictures from Chopper 4. Police tell us multiple bodies were discovered inside this truck. The city health department has issued two citations. From the knockout blow in Brooklyn and the arrest to a seemingly rough takedown to the alleged Manhattan beatdown. Cell phone videos of cops using force have led to protests and concern. And that black and Latino men are getting the majority of summonses and arrests brought this from the mayor today. We don't accept disparity. When we see disparity, we're going to address it. The NYPD this afternoon releasing new numbers showing of 374 social distancing summonses, 193 went to blacks, 111 to Hispanics, 51 to whites. Tonight's story features the recruitment director of a local college who's helping high school seniors celebrate one sign at a time. Here's a little present that we have for you. As he personally welcomed incoming freshmen to Brooklyn St. Francis College with a surprise visit to their homes. Honestly, it means so much because a lot of seniors lost a lot this year. And to the Republic.
or wish and stand. CJ Tardy begins his day with the pledge and a song. Now CJ has some company for his patriotic performance. Parents were expecting a quick drive-by. Instead, Miss <laughs> Thompson surprised her students by dancing and singing along to Ain't No Mountain High Enough.